let me introduce myself. I'm Konsai Bunafa, living in Ottawa May 4th, since May 4th, 1979. I'm going to talk about my story, which I called journey, My Journey to Freedom. I have dedicated this uh, story to my lovely wife, Bantum Bunafa, and our children, Belum, Ashom Chai, Arun Sai, Arun Sai, Ezui, Edison, and Apon Tip. I'm wearing today a special pin which has two symbols, two important symbols. The one is my, uh, my heritage, Rayan Kingdom of Lao, the place where I was born, the place where I grew up, and the place where I escaped from. The second symbol is the three-headed elephant and the freedom flag. I have engraved it into my heart. It will remain there as long as I live. Special thanks uh, to the Freedom and Project, to the, uh, to the Heart and Freedom Project, which had initiated by the Carleton University and University of Winnipeg researchers in conjunction with Lao, Cambodian, and Vietnamese Association. Before I narrated my journey to freedom, however, I'd like to, write, to provide some historical, political, and social background about the Kingdom of Lao. Lao history in brief. Lao is a small land, deadlock country within the Indochina Peninsula, bordered with the China in the northwest, Vietnam in the east and southeast, Cambodia in the south, Thailand to the south and west, and Myanmar to the west. The statistic in 1973 has indicated that uh, we have only three and a half million people. The lowland make up the majority of ethnic. Political event, important political event. After a failed attempt to reclaim the western part of uh, Lao, which remain in Thailand now, uh, the, the late king by the late king Anuvon. The million elephant and the white hub and the white parazon was in ruin. The capital Nguyen Chan has been burned down to ground by the Siamese soldiers. United Kingdom at the time is powerless. They have, sit, they have subdivided into three regions controlled by the Siamese. Just before before the French came over and took control of Laos. Religion, by nature, Lao people are humble and tolerant. Most of Lao people practice Theravada form of Buddhism. I have a map that indicates how the French came over and took control of the Indochina, the whole Indochina Peninsula. I call it the chronology of French colonization of Indochinese Peninsula. France has colonized the Indochinese Peninsula in different period. In 1862 to 1867, they, they colonized uh, the uh, South Vietnam first. They called at that time Cochin China. In 1882 to 84, they controlled Annam, the Central Vietnam. In 1867, part of Cambodia and other part of, uh, in, 18, in 1904 and 1907. The Kingdom of Laos has been conquered in three separate periods. In 1888, north, northeastern part, the north and the, central, and the southern part of Laos in, 19, in 1893, and the, the northern Western part in 1904. The root cause of the conflict in, China, in Indochina. 
Um, after approximately over 50 years of French rule, the three distinct countries, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, became irritated by the French authority and struggled to gain their independence. On May 4, 1954, assisted by the Chinese military uh, advisor and equipped with Chinese weapon, the North Vietnamese defeat the French in Dien Bien Phu. That make the first, that made the end of the first uh, Indochina war. In an effort to end the conflict, Paris, France, granted an, the, uh, an additional measure of independence to Laos in 1953. Under the treaty called franco laos Treaty and Amity and Association. On May 4, 1954, the Geneva Accord reaffirmed the foreign independent territorial integrity and the neutrality of Laos. Newly independent, the Royal Lao government installed with the help of France and the United States. But the leftist government, the leftist faction, were not that happy. They uh, associate with not the, the North Vietnamese and uh, try to uh, uh, try to promote their existence. Lao had dragged into a so-called Vietnam War on the second wave of Indochina War. Laos continued to safeguard its independence, but as Vietnam, but as Vietnam intensified the war against the United States, North Vietnamese defeat the USA. In 1975, the leftist guerrilla, in combination of Laos and Vietnamese, marched into Vientiane and proclaimed the independent cult. Lao People Democratic Republic. That's where my journey to freedom has taken shape. My journey to freedom. September 1975, just before my brother, my mother land has become officially communist state, I returned home, Vientiane from France. After completing successfully the customs and religions from France. One month later, I learned that Lao people in Vientiane encountered new form of changes. I had to adjust and learn new vocabulary, such as radical and feudal reactionaries, rightist bandits, American imperialists, grievance hearing, and so on and so forth. There were protests everywhere in Vientiane. Lao Capitan had become an anarchy. Nobody can be trusted each other. So as a uh, former uh, public servant, I have to uh, control myself and keep myself in a very low profile. 1976 to 1977, I've been assigned to work in multiple positions in various fields that was not related to what I have been trained for. I've, been, I've seen multiple violations of human rights, people being rounded up and arbitrarily arrested. In one scenario that has shaken up my entire life is that a friend of mine accused of being a USA spy without proof, has been arrested before my eyes and his crying family. I haven't seen him since then. I was sent to the call education, re-education camp for over a month, not knowing how my family was doing. I have learned a lot to survive in such precarious situation. 
I'm attending the, 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 what's the, what they call grievance, grievance hearing. I attended the so-called grievance hearing, where a big crowd of people gathered in a boxing area. One man climbed up the stage and shouting and crying, denouncing how bad the old regime is, the, the old regime was. He continued to shout that he got tortured by American dogs. The crowd was cheering, clapping, and chanting, Thou with American, Thou with American, Thou with American. In 1978, these experiences has given me a sense that I should keep adjusting myself at any circumstances. I realized that I was living in a jungle of bandits. I had to be smart than them. The longer I worked uh, with the communist regime, I have noticed that my liberty and my freedom diminished progressively. I have learned how to respect the leader and their oligarch. No one was allowed to criticize the wrongdoing of the party member. The party was considered as supreme commander of God. At that time, I was getting enough. Their family discussion. We can no longer figure out how our future is going to be. How our children will survive when they grow up. We have so many questions without answers. But we have to come up with a final solution. Contact with human smuggler group. There are a lot of uh, human uh, smuggler group at that time. Talk were initiated. Two weeks later, face-to-face -face meeting with the leader of the group. The amount of ransom were discussed. Many years of my saving need to be sacrificed. The escape plan was made only by my wife and myself. We have six children. It's too many. It's too risky to bring them at the same time. We have decided that uh, two of my children, two of my daughters, we go with my mother-in-law, which is in Samanakit, center of Lao. We have decided that my wife has to bring my two daughters, flew into Samanakit, and meet my mother-in-law. The escape was very risky, but successful. In terms of risky, my mother-in-law said to me that, when we were reaching the middle of the Mekong River, a small island with aquatic plant, this one smuggler hold on that plant and shout, I need more money. My mother-in-law said, we already paid. I don't care, but I need money. Otherwise, I will sink the boat. My mother-in-law hide some of cash, local cash, in her underwear. She pulled out all of them and gave it to him and said, this is what I have. This is what I left. And the smuggler said, it's OK. Then they brought them to the other side of to Thailand. They were hiding in the bush, in the banana bush. It was raining at the time. My daughter asked my grandma, they called grandma, where are you going to bring us to? She nearly cried, telling them that I bring to your parents. We've got the, new, the news back from uh, my uncle, who is in the uh, Ubun refugee camp, that your daughter is safe. They are with me. Then my wife flew back to Vientiane. Final decision. The full amount of ransom has been made. The appointment was set. November 28, 1978, 
at 7.30 at a.m. at Tanaleng Port. Early morning that day, my family and my friends showed up at the port. The head of the smuggler group greeted us. They gave the sign that we should be boarded right away and recommended to sit down on the bottom of the of the boat. We saw many people, but we don't know them. November 28, 1978. This is the boat that, that brought us to, uh, to, uh, this is the boat that we, we brought. That, it's uh, November 28, 1978. The mid-range boat belonged to the human smugglers. Uh, look exactly like the right I show you. Normally, it was used for commercial transportation. But on that particular day, they were all humans. My mind was spinning because we were in a very risky business. And my family life depends on us. Can we trust the smuggler? What if they inform the Coast Guard? We will be arrested and executed. Hundred and hundred questions spinning in my mind. But our determination was already set at any cost. We stayed calm and kept our low profile. A little bit over 9 a.m., the boat left Tanaleng port heading southward. As we sailed along the Mekong River, every one of us was very nervous. We did not know what would happen to us. We were thinking between life and death. The day life was gone. The night set in. The boat slowed down and stopped in a small village. We didn't know where about? The head, of the, the head of the group told us that we are going to stay here overnight. I will start moving in the next morning. November 29, 1978. At dawn, the boat started moving. I was sailing for about half an hour, and suddenly the head of the group told us, now it's time to go. It was 5.15 a.m. We started quickly to wake up my kids, pick up our belongings, and got down to the sampan. When I saw the, the, the small rain sampan floating alongside in hiding position on the right side of the big boat, we realized that they bought the sampan in that village. We've loaded our belongings, the kids and the women, all men, my friend and myself, were jumping into the water and swimming. No time to get undressed. The last word from the head of the smuggler was, good luck to all of you. <clears throat> Sorry. At the same time, at the same time, he then pushed the sampan toward the shore. The sampan load capacity was just enough to hold my kids and the belongings and two women. At that time, the water was calm and warm. If one more additional passenger into the boat, the boat would be sinking. By eyeball, the distance between I was jumping into the, into the water to the shore is approximately 150 meters. When you are swimming with the clothes on, the water resistance is heavy. I was completely exhausted at about 25 meters from the shore. Uh, I am at a very dangerous event. What I was using is that I try to I try to plunge my body down deeper, deeper until I reach 
the bottom of the river. Luckily, my feet was on the floor. At the same time, I was using all my strength to push myself upward to the surface and catch the breath. And I kept repeating that few times until I reached the shore. I was completely exhausted. I was painted. I fainted and lay down on the ground. My friends and my wife came over and gave me a lot of muscles. I was almost gone, so it's a pretty sad story. At that time, I was asking my friends, are we in Thailand? Are we in Thailand? The answer was yes. This is the, this is the boat, this is sampan that uh, that drive uh, that carry us to a safety and the Mekong River to Thailand. It's like this here. After 10 minutes of rest and massage from my friend, I regained my strength. As we walked up the Mekong River bank, we met a middle-aged man. He was very kind. We, we told him, the sampan at the shore is yours. He was happy. He offered us hospitality and also a small breakfast. We uh, realized that uh, we were at a district of uh, Pon Visay in Thailand, province of uh, Nong Khai. The Thai immigration officer were informed. We waited until 8.30 a.m. The officer came over and as we gave him full report, of our journey. He checked our belonging and got detailed information about us. Paperwork was done. We were transferred <clears throat> uh, from the man who was giving us warm hospitality to a Buddhist temple. We call it Pagoda. We spent the night there. November 30th, 1978. The meat range pickup brought us to a new location called Illegal Entry Detention Center, located right in front of uh, the Lao refugee camp Nong Kai, Thailand. We were among 800 plus people in that particular cell. I have a video clip on that. The center was not adequate to hold such number of people. For any reason, for many reasons, I'm sorry. The center was completely blocked by high steel, by high steel metal fences. It has gone, it has one house, a long bamboo hut. Toilet was overloaded and no water to clean up. So people will ease themselves and urinate wherever they can. Hygiene was reduced to almost zero. Even feast is older, fill up the center. No matter where you go. We stay there, we stay in the center for 10 days. Food was distributed twice daily, lunch and supper time. We did not take a shower. We bought a gallon of 20 liters of water to clean up ourselves with wet towels. The day was long and tedious. We walked around, we talked around, slept. Luckily, there was no rain at all. We stayed there for 10 days. Now, December 10, 1978. We were setting free from hardship of that detention center. Thai authority called up our name and we form a long line. There must be at least over 200 people. We walk toward the refugee camp. Luckily, when we reach the camp, 
we met a friend that will leave the camp by tomorrow for Australia. So the room will be free for us. Well, it was not really free. We bought it. We paid it. The room was approximately four by six meters. It should be okay for all of us. Now we split. We came with our friends. My friend went to the other building. So now Leo Lao refugee camp. I have a photo on that. It consists of two separate camps. One camp for Hmong and the other camp for Lao Lo, Lo Land. Within the camp there were many long bamboo buildings. Uh, we were in the building number two. I have no idea how 30,000 to 45,000 Lao refugees can fit in there. But we made it. Family union. You remember? My two daughters uh, went to my bed with my uh, mother-in-law that is central, uh, in central in Ubon camp. Now I have to get my daughter back. When installed in the camp, the secure room for our family, my wife made contact with my mother-in-law in Ubon Lao refugee camp, Thailand. A week later, my mother-in-law came to Nong Kai Lao refugee camp, and my daughter came back to us. It was an emotional day. Sorry. I haven't seen my daughter for almost two months. Now we are on the umbrella of UNHCR. <clears throat> uh, I've heard that each refugee family in the camp supposed to get the food assistance of $10 per day. But what we got was far from the reality to be able to survive. We sell what we have, getting some food, buying food in the camp. Daily routine in the camp. The camp was overcrowded and dangerous. We were, we were always in high alert. We spent most of the time, I spent most of the time with my family, reading, magazine, newspaper, whatever you can find. And we've heard big news. The Chinese waging war with the Vietnamese under the code name, Teaching Lesson to the Vietnamese. That was 1979. A week later, I wrote new letter to uh, High Commissioner in Singapore. I have stated that, I have stated clearly that our family would like to visit in Canada. At the same time, we've got, uh, we got two father and uh, two godfathers in Ottawa, Jean Guido Fushito and Andre René. We've got the answer from the uh, High Commissioner, Canadian High Commissioner in Singapore, somewhere in March 1979. And our godfather, we've got the answer from them as well. We've got the interview with the Canadian authority somewhere about April, April 1979. By the end of April, we got the confirmation from Canadian representative telling us on May 1st, 1979, few steps needed to be done prior to departure. Medical checkup by the International Community of Red Cross, Canadian Immigration record, um, record and Visa, and the pass will be leaving the camp tomorrow morning. May 2nd, 1979, the bus full of Lao refugees started leaving the camp. My heart was pounding and my mind was crying. Bye bye, my motherland my relatives, and my friends. We arrived at Suan Pu, Suan Plu, 
park, Bangkok, Thailand, late in the afternoon. We slept overnight in the park. So far, we have lived in Thailand camp for five months and three days. May 3rd, 1979. In the morning, a group of refugees were called up and loaded into a bus and headed to Don Mueang Airport. Everyone of us were checked and boarded into the plane. When the airplane took us into the air, my heart was filled with safety and freedom. On the way to Canada, we got transit in Paris. Canada has become my country, May 4th, 1979. We arrived at the Mirabon Airport, Montreal, late in the afternoon. We waited for a while, then we boarded into the other airplane. We landed in Ottawa Airport in the evening. We met our godfather, André René, who drove us to the apartment that has been rented for us prior to our arrival. It was a long and exhausting traveling day, but happy to be able to breathe the air of freedom. <clears throat> Starting a new life in Ottawa, love has a humble culture and tradition. I was young, full of energy, and ready to stand on my own feet and take care of my family. My children were too young to understand this brand new land called Canada. All of us have a language barrier. <clears throat> My wife and I had the chance to go to the training course called ESN, English as a Second Language, sponsored by Canada Employment Center. We've been sponsored by the government anyhow. <clears throat> Our children were registered in school. They were sitting in the dark and not knowing what the teacher was talking about. Adapting a new culture was difficult, but not for me, but for my children will be, it will be. It might create a culture shock, but I came up with the new idea that the combination of uh, the Canadian culture and Lao culture, I, learned, I make a synthesis of the two. I came up with a new idea that apply to my kids. This idea seemed to be successful. They understand. Fortunately, I had background in French and my ESL went quite well. I took over with the influx of the Chinese coming to Ottawa. Marian Dior, the mayor of Ottawa, has set up a sponsoring network called Project 4000. You can ask me about that. In 1979, she led the Project 4000, in which Ottawa residents sponsored 4,000 Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laos and refugees. The Ottawa people, group churches, sponsors, and individuals have heard the mayor appeal. It was the first job that I had in Ottawa, Project 4000, coordinator of interpreter. It seemed to me that Project 4000 was a successful one. Meanwhile, my wife has the first job in the restaurant, cooking french fry, dressing hamburger, and so on. When Project 4000 winding down, I decided to go back to, to Angonkan College, learning technology. While working, I kept updating my skill set, study networking technology. Finally, I got a good job with Nortel Networks as a hardware developer. The DMB department. I have a, uh, a recognition award that I brought in with me. I'll show you later. The over 100 years Nortel Networks was f facing financial crisis at the time. They were selling out their business. And then my department had been bought by Ericsson. I was transferred to Ericsson and worked there until my retirement 
uh, September 6, 19, 2013. Becoming officially Canadian citizen on January 26, 1974. 1984, I'm sorry. That was the reign of Liberal government under the Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. I received one condolition letter from the Prime Minister, from the House Speaker, Lloyd Francis at the time, and Secretary of State, Cher Joyal. I think I have made a good decision to uh, resettle in Canada today. And my children are well educated and become independent and self-sufficient. Having their own family, I think my life is a success. Canada is, and its people have given my family a very warm welcome. From my standpoint, Canada is the best country to live. Just to name a few, security, excellent healthcare system, good well-being system, champion in all human rights, and democratic system. This is what I call Canada, the land of generosity, the land of opportunity, and the land of prosperity. Thank you, Canada, for giving my family the opportunity to get good education, working alongside with Canadians, no matter what, enjoying the democratic system and freedom and human rights, and uh, moving forward. Thank you very much for telling me your story. You're welcome. Very well presented. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you a couple of questions, though. Uh, at one point, uh, the family made a decision that two of your daughters would go with your mother-in-law, and then the rest of the family would stay together. Um, and, you're, and at that time, the decision had been made that you would be leaving the country. That's right. So your mother-in-law and your two daughters left separately, and you and the, your wife and the other four children also left separately. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you told, I, th I thought you told the story very well of crossing the Mekong River. Thank you. And uh, finally arriving in Thailand. So once you arrived in Thailand, you said that you spent a period of time in, a, in some kind of a center prior to going to Long Kai. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And can, can you talk a little bit about uh, your time in that center, what that was about? Okay. Please. I have indicated in my story, and that center is, uh, is particularly made for the illegal entry, okay. illegal entry detention center. Okay. And there is a clip on that, and they call it the detention center, what I call the illegal entry okay. uh, detention center. Right. And we never thought that uh, we are going to uh, submit into that particular um, care. Yeah. So that at that time, I mean, there were only, there were approximately eight, over 800 people. It's overcrowded already. Yeah. So the, uh, the, uh, uh, the washroom, I would call the washroom, is completely full, yeah. overloaded. Feces everywhere in the toilet. There is no toilet. So I don't want to explain more. It's, it's too graphic uh, to explain. That's fine. Because we are, everybody uh, will easing themselves. You uh, need wherever they want. Right. Uh, okay? Now, it's a it's, it's horrible situation. Yes. Because the order. Uh, the order was horrible, but we have to stay there. We have, we have no place to go. Hygiene was not existent. No, hygiene is completely yeah. new. Right. So, so when we are eating, yeah. we're eating like that. Right. So nothing to do. What you can do is walking around, yes. try to talk to somebody else. That's killing time. Yes. So uh, we we were lucky to. Uh, to be uh, to be able to sustain that kind of uh, situation, yes. there was no rain, mm. 
So if the rain comes comes down, we don't know how much disease will be exposed to us. So you left that detention center and went to to Long Kai. Yeah, we've been there for ten days, exactly ten days. Okay. So in May, uh, in uh, I think in December December ten, nineteen seventy eight, they were released us into the Bay camp, right. a Lao refugee camp. And then eventually you met with your mother-in-law and your two daughters in, in the refugee camp. Um, <clears throat> no. Okay. I've met with my, brother, my brother-in-law. Okay. Because my brother-in-law was in Ubon refugee camp okay. in Central. Uh, when my mother-in-law brought my two daughters uh, to, uh, uh, to Thailand, they were unit, unit, reunited with my brother-in-law. Okay. okay? Um, I uh, <clears throat> we connect him when we when we have we will secure the room that we are, we will be able to hold our our children. Then we connect to my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law came over with my two daughters from Ubon camp when we were reunited again. Okay. So. So the, everyone was together, your children, your wife, your brother-in-law, your mother-in-law? Not my mother-in-law. Not your mother No. Okay. They, they didn't came. Right. And then everyone left to go to Bangkok? Eight of us. Eight of us. Okay. We'll leave the uh, refugee camp to Son uh, Plu, Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand, yes. Okay. And you stayed in, in Bangkok just overnight? Just overnight. Okay. And then you flew to Ottawa from, from there? Yeah, from from, from Don Mueang, we flew to, uh, to Ottawa, yes, okay. to Canada in Ottawa. Okay. So when you arrived in Ottawa, you talked about your experience of being able to find employment, your, your spouse found employment as well, mm -hmm. and as I understand it, your children would have pursued their education. Okay. Uh, did you, as a family, did you also get involved with uh, other uh, Laos individuals? Uh, were, were you members of associations? Uh, did you spend time uh, supporting each other, the Laos population? Could you talk about that? That's a very good question. When I arrived here, I have no relatives, only friends. And we have to get together. I was the founder of the Laos Association in Ottawa. You founded it? The five, okay. I was the founder of the uh, Law Association in Ottawa. We were talking to each other and trying to help each other. Because we are in a new society, we have to adjust. We have to come up with our help. It, we help each other. At the time, I was speaking English better than, than them, so that I would make more. And my job was the uh, interpretation either going to buy clothes, grocery, and other help. And we set up a new Lao New Year. And you know what? We, we, brought, our, we brought from Laos our culture and tradition because it is in our heart, in our soul. We come here and try to expand our Laotian culture to the Canadian and other organizations too. So we did what we can. And the, the Lao Association that you founded still exists today, as I understand. Exists today. Okay. Exists today. Now, Som is also the president of that particular association. Right. In Carry On. Okay. I am 77, so uh, Som is very young. <laughs> He's talented. He could go beyond. Right. Okay. okay. Talking about job, I have a. Uh, uh, a um, error recognition that I'd like to show you. Sure. Okay. Just hold on. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is the recognition of my personal contribution to the success of the CDMA. The success of? CDMA. Okay. It's a technology called um, okay. CDMA called uh, um, Code Division. Multiple access. 
it's a brand new technology that we we were very successful in uh, in 2007. And this is one of my contribution to Notion Networks. Okay. Great. Thank you. Could I ask you? Could you tell me about what your experience was like with uh, Project Four Thousand? I'm assuming that you were involved somehow with Project Four Thousand. Could you talk about your experience? Okay. Thank you. That's a good question too. I've been involved with the, uh, the uh, not only Lao Association, also with the Vietnamese and the, uh, and the Cambodian Association. We were getting together um, because we, we, we need each other. So uh, the liaison or the bond within, within these three associations must be, uh, must be together uh, so that the, uh, the, the Vietnamese Association will help the uh, Vietnamese but I coordinate only the interpretation. Whenever the Vietnamese need the interpretation, I call up the association and, okay, this is a family need more help from you because you have the language. And also the uh, Cambodian association, the same thing. It, uh, it's, uh, it's a hard job. It's a lot of job and I spend a lot of time going around with them, either going to, uh, the, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to see a doctor, to the hospital, and also for uh, shopping. So I have to ex explain to them how to use them, how to buy the stuff, uh, and also how to, uh, how to wear during the winter time, and how to use the bus, things like that. Uh, so the uh, Project 4000 is very, very helpful. And I'm proud to be there with others. And in your experience, you, you, you not only helped Laos Laotians, but you also helped Vietnamese individuals and Cambodian individuals as well. Yes, I know them all. Okay. I know the leaders. And during the time when the Vietnamese was Lee Khan, Khan Lee, Khan Lee, Dr. Khan Lee. Okay. And uh, the, Viet, the, the Cambodian was Sean B. Chin. Okay. And uh, we, we, we have uh, quite often the meeting uh, between the three of us. So. The uh, um, the heart and freedom came back for the same from the same theme. The uh, though we got together again uh, on the heart and freedom uh, project with the same three association, but different leaders anyway. Okay. Now let me ask you about your children. So I, I'm assuming all your children are young adults, and they all pursued their education, and they're all employed. All the employed, they are well, okay. they are self-sufficient, they okay. are independent. Okay. But I have one boy, he's, he's infirmed. And living with me now is only one boy. Okay. Well, my wife, myself, and uh, his name is Edison. Okay. He has been infected by a, a disease, uh, probably by malaria, attacking his brain. Uh, he has some form of uh, hydrocephalic. When we got here, we get him the, uh, to the hospital, the central hospital, and the doctor has said that he has the hydrocephalic. I don't know what, what kind of <coughs> uh, disease. But the doctor has suggested that his brain, his brain has too much cerebral uh, fluid. Every of us has but he has too much. So part of his brain has been flooded by this cerebral fluid. It has to be drained down. So his, his bottom part of the body is weak, very weak. Now by draining, that, that cerebral fluid is very nutritive. By draining this fluid down to his stomach, they put a shunt from his brain here and down to his stomach. And six months later, he started to walk. He was crawling when we came here. Uh, six months later, he started to walk. He started to uh, speak properly. And finally, within a year or two, he started to walk. Not very good, but so far so good. Okay. Now he is okay, but 
but his memory has been damaged. Okay. So he could only um, speak, um, not doing anything uh, good for him, but so we take care of him. Right. He has been under o OCD or OPD, uh, uh, under the, uh, the, Kine uh, the uh, Ontario government for, for, uh, for disabled people. He's okay. Okay. So I would like to ask you one one other question. The other question I would like to ask you is, it, it, let's say you were invited by a, a university or a college or a high school to come and speak to the students about what the experience was like for you and your family to leave your mother country and to come to Canada. What do you think would be important to share with those individuals? Okay. In your opinion. When I work with, uh, with the Lao Association, I'm a volunteer. And I'm ready and I open my heart to all the students who want to know my story. Okay. So what do you think you would tell them? What would you want to share with them? I will share what I have. I will share my own story. I will share my experience in Laos, in the re-education camp. I will share whatever I have, so that we, that we, that I'm able to connect to other people, and let them know my full story.